Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for your people. Thank you for the ministers. Thank you for all the members, all our leaders. Thank you for everyone present here. We're asking you, Lord, that your word will come straight by your anointing, by your spirit, into every heart. In Jesus' name, Amen. keep us awake. Give us understanding. And let your spirit interpret and apply the word to every heart and to every hearer in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Tonight, we're studying from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're reading from verse 14, studying all through to verse 22. Let's look at verse 14. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Verse 14, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. It's very interesting and very instructive to understand that the Lord, through the apostle by the Spirit of God, is speaking to New Testament believers and is speaking to people today, speaking to you and speaking to me. And it may be surprising to you that in a civilized world and with the position in which we are in the world today, you don't see idols on the street. You don't see idols in many places. But then the Lord is still saying, Wherefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Obviously, he's talking to the church. And he calls us the beloved. He calls us the believers, the people who have turned away from the world and they have turned unto the Lord. They have repented of their sins. They have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. A change has taken place in their lives. And now they are on their way to heaven. And the Lord is still saying, Wherefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. It's not just to leave idolatry alone. It says flee, which means it will come and confront you. Idolatry from the right, idolatry from the left, idolatry from the community will come and then it says you are not to stop there. You are not to meditate and think of them. You are not to interact with them. You are to take to your feet spiritually and run and flee from idolatry. Now, you might think such a study does not concern us. How will the Lord be telling us to flee from idolatry? I don't worship idol. Even before I came to know the Lord as my personal savior, I never worshiped idol. And so to tell me now, we're studying something that says, flee from idolatry. How about that? Well, you understand, in the New Testament, in the mind of God, idolatry doesn't always mean a stone or a piece of wood that you place on ground, you pour oil on, and you are worshipping. When you have anything, whatever it is, when you have any idea, whatever it is, and when you have any opinion, anything of essence that you place before God, and beyond God and above God that becomes an idol. When you worship something, when you love something, when you give your mind and your heart to anything apart from God, that means that you are worshiping an idol. That thing you love above God, that thing you raise above God, that thing you bow down to in your mind and you submit to in your heart, apart from God, apart from the word of God, apart from the will of God, apart from the revelation of God, that becomes an idol. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, and we're looking at verse 5 and verse 6. Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 5. It says, but this ye know, that no monger or unclean person nor a covetous man, look at this, who is an idolater. A covetous man is an idolater. Somebody who has whatever it is, money, material things, he sets that in the heart and is pursuing that. Is pursuing that apart from the will of God. Is pursuing that apart from the revelation of God. He wants whatever it is by all means 
and is covetous. He wants that thing above the will of God, above the word of God. That is an idol that that person is pursuing. And he says, you know, that no monger, no unclean person, and no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Then it says in verse 6, it says, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these sins cometh the wrath of God because of covetousness, because of idolatry, because of setting something up in your heart, in your mind, and you're pursuing above God and beyond God and apart from God. It says, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. It tells us in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, looking at verse 21. Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither was thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And then in verse 22, it tells us, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, verse 23 says, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 24, in verse 24 it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the laws of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it says they changed the truth of God into a lie. Look at this now. And they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. It tells us what idolatry is when anyone worships the creature more than the creator, worships the creature above the creator, and he places anything created. When we say anything created, material things are created things. Human beings, men and women, are created things. And all the papers and everything people pursue, if they pursue them above God, and beyond God and apart from God that becomes idolatry because it says they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator and that's the creator who is blessed forever and ever that's why we're looking at this today we're coming back now to first Corinthians chapter 10 and we're reading from verse 14 again the necessity of implicit faith in the living God. All those idols are dead gods. All those creatures are dead things. And if you exalt them, if you lift them up, if you worship them above and beyond, apart from the living God, you don't have your faith, implicit faith and total faith and the, the foundational faith in the living God. But it is necessary to forsake idols, necessary to flee from idols, and then to serve the living God, him and him alone. We're dividing the message to three parts today. Number one, the imperative of forsaking idolatry to serve God. It's an imperative. It's a commandment. It's something that God demands and it's a non-negotiable. It's imperative. It commands us. We flee from idolatry. Number one, the imperative of forsaking idolatry to serve God. Point number two, the inconsistency and filthiness of idolatry in serving God. It's inconsistent. You have the living God and then you have dead God's idols and you bring them together. You are bowing to dead God on the left and to the living God on the right. That's inconsistent. That's not proper. And it is filthy. The inconsistency and filthiness of idolatry is serving God. Point number three, the impossibility of fellowship with idols 
while serving God. It's not possible. If you are serving God, the living God, if you claim to be saved, if you claim to be a child of God, if you claim that you are now in the kingdom of God and you are in the light, you cannot be in the light and in darkness at the same time. And you cannot be looking up and looking down at the same time. You cannot be going on two roads at the same time. You cannot serve the living God and the dead idols all together at the same time. The impossibility of fellowship with idols while serving God. Point number one now. Number one, let's come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 14 wherefore my beloved that means my beloved brethren that means children of god that means sons and daughters of god that means the pilgrims who are on their way to heaven my my dearly beloved flee from idolatry why it's like you see fire burning and then somebody says flee you say why because it will burn you because it will destroy you and because it will devastate every good thing in your life. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and they rose up to play. They were destroyed because of that. Look at verse 8. What goes along with uh, idol worship? Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed. And they fed in one day 3 and 20,000. It's that serious. It's because of that seriousness. It's because of that danger. It's because of that devastation. It's because of what happened to the people of the past. That's why he's telling us today, flee from idolatry. He tells us in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 41. Acts, chapter 7, reading from verse 41, is reminding us now what happened to the people that came out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness and they were making their way to the land of promise. Look at what happened. And they made a cow in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol. They made a cow and they offered sacrifice to that cow, an idol. And they rejoiced in the work of their own hands. Look at verse 42. Verse 42 says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrificed by the space of 40 years in the wilderness. You remember them? In the wilderness, they drank miracle water and yet they worshipped idols. They received manna from heaven and yet they worshipped idols. The Lord opened a way for them through the Red Sea and yet they worshipped idols and he conquered the Amalekites for them. He did a lot of things for them in the wilderness and yet with all those blessings and yet with all the provision they worshipped idols and it says by the space of 40 years in the wilderness that's what they did and therefore the Lord turned away from them that's why the commandment is coming to us now the imperative is coming to us flee idolatry in fact in chapter 15 of Acts the Lord by the Spirit of God talking to the Gentile church and you see the leaders and the apostles and the preachers in the in the church and to one thing he told them in Acts chapter 15 reading from verse 20 how they must forsake idol how they must turn away from idol it says open your Bible Acts chapter 15 verse 20 but that were right unto them and that they abstain from pollutions of idols. Idol pollutes. Idol will corrupt. Idol will defile you. Whether the idol is in the heart or the idol is in the home 
or the idol is something you raise up in your mind above God and beyond God and beside God it brings pollution it brings defilement and it brings judgment in the sight of God and it says that you abstain from the pollutions of idols and from fornication and from strangled and from blood verse 28 in verse 28 for it seemed good to the holy ghost this is the word of the holy ghost and this is the revelation of the holy ghost and this is the commandment and the imperative the holy ghost is given to the church the church of the gentiles and the church of every nation and the church of every generation and the church of every denomination that it seemed good unto the holy ghost and to us and to lay upon you no greater bodies than these necessary things this is necessary and what are those necessary things look at verse 29 in verse 29 that ye abstain from meats offered to idols that if you're a child of god if you're not born again and if you're your way to heaven if the holy spirit has done the work of grace in your heart and you say you are now a member of the family of god and you are worshiping god in spirit and in truth you abstain from all the things that are offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if ye keep yourselves ye you shall do well you'll do well in jesus name and then it says fear ye well acts chapter 17 we're reading from verse 16 acts chapter 17 verse 16 now while paul waited for them at athens his spirit was touched in him when he saw the city only given to idolatry it was in the city and paul the apostle as was waiting for others to join him in his missionary team he saw that the city was given over completely to idolatry and because of that he began to bring the word to them the word of repentance and the word of reconciliation with god and the word of salvation and the word of eternal life and in the word of eternal life what did he tell them look at verse 30 in verse 30 he says and the times of this ignorance but wink at but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent remember he's addressing their idolatry he's addressing they're worshiping the creature that is idols of their own creation idols that they made for themselves idols that they manufactured for themselves and then he's telling them you're full of superstition and you're full of tradition and you're full of idolatry but now the lord is willing to overlook the past if you will repent and turn away from that idolatry the times of this ignorance god went out but now commanded all men not only those people in athens not only those people in the greek world but all men everywhere they are now to repent why what if they did not repent what if they said they'll continue with their idolatry look at verse 31 in verse 31 because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead the lord jesus christ went to calvary he died for our sins because god is not willing that any should perish and now that he has died the opportunity is there for everyone to turn from idolatry 
to turn from their sin, to turn from the works of darkness, and to turn from every evil sin, turning from sin and iniquity and transgression, and then coming to the Lord. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then their sins will be forgiven. Their lives will turn around. They will no more continue in the worship of idols. And when the judgment day comes, then they will escape. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 9, telling us why it's imperative and why it is compulsory, why everyone will have to identify if there's any idol in your heart, any idol in your life, any idol in your family, any idol in your pursuit that you will identify that idol and then push that idol away and run away and flee from idolatry. This is the reason why in First Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 9, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't you know? Don't you understand? You're part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of grace, and the kingdom of light, and the kingdom of power, and the kingdom that belongs to the Lord and the Son of God. It's opposed to the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of the devil. Have you not heard that the unrighteous, the sinner, the transgressor, and the one who remains in that unrighteousness shall not by any means enter, inherit the kingdom of God? What does that mean to be unrighteous? What does that mean? To be sinful what does that mean to miss the kingdom of god who are the people that will miss that kingdom it tells us neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind you see there he mentions the idol worshipers the idolaters and then he says in verse 10 in verse 10, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners, none of them shall inherit the kingdom of God. And since we know that the kingdom of God is everlasting, is forever and ever and ever, and we want to be in that kingdom of God. We don't want to be on the other side with Satan, with the devil and his angels. And that will be forever and ever too. That's why since we know idolatry will send a person to that kingdom of the devil and kingdom of darkness and a place of suffering forever and ever that's why we flee idolatry at all times and in all ways it tells us in first john chapter 5 verse 21 first john chapter 5 verse 21 little children what he means is not talking to toddlers he's talking about children of god you're born again you're a baby in Christ, you're a child of God. Maybe you don't know much, but you need to know as much as these little children. Those who have just come into the kingdom of God. And of course, all those who have come before, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourself. Let there be a spiritual distance between you and idolatry. Idol in any form. Whatever will take your heart away from God, whatever you will take your attention away from God, whatever will make you focus your attention on a sin. And if you forsake God and abandon God, it says you keep yourself away from such a sin. Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 21. We're reading from verse 8. It tells us, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and all mongers and sorcerers 
and idolaters and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burned with fire and brimstone which is the second death that is the second separation from god the final separation from god and the eternal separation from god who are the people that will be separated from god for all eternity final without any reverse final without any possibility of reconciling with god again and it is referred to as the second day death means separation when your spirit is separated from the body that's physical death and when spiritually now we are separated from god because somebody is not born again that is spiritual death and when somebody forever eternally irrevocably is separated from god that is the second death is the death of death and now the people that will be separated from god for all eternity number one the fearful if i forsake that idolatry i don't know what they will do to me if i forsake that syncretic assembly where they are not worshiping god they have said anytime you leave uh, this place this is going to happen and you are living a fearful life you don't have a mind of your own uh, and you can't decide this is the way to go and this is what i'm going to do you know the will of god you know the word of god you know the calling of god upon your life but you cannot do it because you are afraid of so and so that so and so becomes an idol you lift up that man you lift up that woman you lift up that whoever that person is you lift him up above god and because you're afraid of him is your idol if you die in that condition that will be second death and then it says murderers why do people murder the murder because you know he wants that thing another person wants that thing and because he wants that thing so much that's why he goes to take up the life of the other fellow so that he can have the house or the land or the property or the money why because of idolatry he so much exhausts what he wants and what he desires that he wants it so much that's an idol that he destroys the life of another person then he says or oh, the all mongers is talking that's another word for adulterers fornicators and for the unclean people and what's that when somebody cherishes his body so much and i want that pleasure of the body I know it's illegitimate, I know it's unrighteous, I know it's sinful, I know it's unscriptural, but I want the pleasure of the flesh so much that I must commit uh, that sin, even if people will know eventually, but I want the pleasure so much, and then you go to commit that sin, what's that? You elevate and you exalt that pleasure of the flesh above any other consideration. That pleasure of the flesh becomes an idol. And then it says, and sorcerers, who are the sorcerers? Those are the witches and the wizards. And why do they do what they do? Why did they bewitch anyone? And why will they hurt the life of another person with occultic power? Well, the reason is they want something. And the gain they want to have as a result of using their sorcery, that gain becomes so much on them that they just must hurt another person with their witchcraft. That's idolatry because a witchcraft itself is idolatry and the desire for such a thing that you have to destroy another person, that thing you desire becomes an idol. And then it says all liars. Now, why would I tell a lie? If I ever told a lie, it means I want something. I'm protecting something. I'm preserving something. I'm protecting myself. 
and preserving myself and self becomes so important that I have to tell my brother, I have to tell my sister, I have to tell my husband, I have to tell my wife a lie to protect self. Self becomes so big, it must be protected. And if I cannot find anything to protect that self except telling a lie, then I have to tell the lie. The self you are protecting with a lie. The property you are getting with a lie. The position you are keeping with a lie. Or any prestige you are keeping with a lie. That thing becomes an idol. That's why it says, don't you understand? And don't you know that the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the mongers and the sorcerers and all idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What's the Lord expecting? The Lord is expecting will come out of all those things. If you're a Christian, you're a child of God, anyone in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. I pray that in your life, in my life, in our lives, in our families, in the church, will be new creatures, all of us, in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're reading from verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? How could you strike a league, an agreement, fellowship, with idols if you are a child of god you are the temple of god and if you are the temple of god and the holy spirit abides in you and the word of god abides in you it says what agreement has the temple of god with idols for ye are the temple of the living god as god has said i will dwell in them and walk in them and i will be their god and they shall be my people. In verse 17, it says, Wherefore come out from among them? Wherefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Idolatry is unclean. Immorality is unclean. Defilement is unclean. Any transgression, iniquity is unclean. Any walk of darkness is unclean. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. It's not going to receive the sinner just as he is. He must repent. He must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. He must come out of that idolatry. And then God has a welcoming hand, a welcoming attitude. And he says, and I will receive you. Only then you become a child of God, a son, a daughter of God. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, and I will be a father unto you. It's not a father to idolaters. Is not a, a father to idol worshippers. Is not a father to those who exalt the creature above the creator. It is when we turn away from idol worship. We turn away from transgression. We turn away from iniquity. That he will now become a father. And ye shall be sons and daughters unto him, says the Lord Almighty. I pray that this word of the Lord will bear fruit in every heart and we're not going to exalt any man, any woman, any material thing or money or whatever. We're not going to exalt any sin above our God in Jesus' name. But looking in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you. How ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's Christianity. That's real conversion. That's somebody who is a member of the kingdom of God turning to God 
from idols, any idol, internal idol, external idol, monetary idol, material idol, human idol, whatever, turn it from idols to serve the living and the true God. And then in verse 10, it says now in verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. If you have not turned away from idols, every form of idol, if there is anything you cherish, anything you worship, anything you serve, anything you give your heart to, and that thing is so important, you cannot give up that thing and turn to God fully, wholeheartedly. You are not waiting for the coming of the Lord. You might talk about rapture. You might talk about the saints going home. And you might talk about the day of resurrection. You might talk about the second coming of the Lord. If you have not turned away from idols to serve, the living and the true God, you are not waiting for the sun coming from heaven. It is when you turn away from all idolatry. You turn away from everything that holds your attention, holds your heart, and keeps you away from God. When you turn away from those things, then you wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who has delivered us from the wrath to come. If you have not turned away from idol worship completely, entirely, and permanently with all your heart and your center, your affection only on God, you are not delivered yet from the wrath to come. Because the wrath of God is coming on the idol worshippers. If you are still worshipping idol and cherishing idol, there's something you cannot give up. You cannot give it up for the glory of God. You cannot give it up even to obey the commandment of God. You are not delivered yet from the wrath to come. It is when you abandon those seas and you flee away from all forms of idolatry. That's when you're delivered from the wrath to come. We're coming to point number two now. In point number two, we're looking at the inconsistency and the filthiness of idolatry in serving God. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 15. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Uh, Paul the Apostle talking to the Corinthians, he, he, he was say, telling them, what I'm telling you is obvious. What I'm telling you is plain. What I'm telling you is logical. And if you are wise men, if you are intelligent believers, this will not be strange unto you. Look at Jeremiah chapter 8, reading from verse 8. Jeremiah Chapter 8, verse 8, it says, How do ye say we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made ye eat, the pain of the scribe is in vain. And then it says in verse 9, in verse 9, the wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed, and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them. Here the prophet is saying, are you wise? The way we'll know you are wise is that the wisdom of God is in you. What's the wisdom of God? That's the word of God. That's the revelation of God. If you say you are wise, but then you reject the word of God, the wisdom of God, the revelation of God that will pave the way for you for eternity. If you reject that, where is the wisdom? What wisdom is in them? We're wise only when we take the word of God, we accept the word of God, and we believe and embrace and practice the word of God. What's the word of God? Abandon idolatry. Any scene of idols don't have anything to do with them. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 10, 
we're looking at verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2. Thus says, My Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. That's our wisdom. That's our wisdom. Learn not the way of the heathen, the way of the Gentile, the way of the pagan, the way of the idol worshiper. You are Israelites. He was talking to the children of Israel. And you see the manifestation of the power of God and the idols of Egypt could not deliver all those Israelites from the Egyptians. How then will you go to a powerless God that cannot deliver their people? You saw what the Lord did to Pharaoh and to the chariots in the Red Sea and you are now on this other side and by the power of God you walked on dry ground how will you be so foolish and go back to the idols of Egypt? It says, learn not the way of the heathen. Now the heathen are the unbelievers. They do not know the Lord. They might know some literature book. They might know some ideas of the world. They might have some information in the world. But that's not my spiritual revelation. That's not the revealed word of God. They are heathens. They do not know the way of salvation. They are heathen. They do not know the way to God. They are heathen. They do not know the way to heaven. If you have the gospel, if you have the good news, if you have the word of grace, if you have the word of eternal life, you are wiser than the wisest of the people of the world. And they will try to teach you their own way and their own principles and their own practices, which will not lead to heaven because all the wisdom they have is given unto them by the God of this world, by Satan. That's why he's saying, thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. We should not learn their way. The Lord preserve us in Jesus' name. Look at verse 15 there, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 15. They are vanity and the works of error. That's why it says, don't go there. Don't learn those things. You have the word of eternal life. You have the good news. You have the gospel. You have the revelation of God that shows us very clearly the way to heaven. And you know what Jesus Christ is to us? He's a savior. He's a redeemer. All our needs are supplied by him spiritually and physically and naturally. Everything we need, we get from him. Why are you going to go to the errors of the people of the world? They are vanity and their works of errors in the time of their visitation. Tell me what follows there. I said, tell me aloud what you see there. Tell me out aloud what you read there. They shall perish. I will not perish. Says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We already have all the message we need and the good news we need and the gospel of grace that we need so that we will not perish. Why then are you going to learn the practices of the people of the world which only will lead them to destruction and perdition? You will not go into the world and you will not have anything to do with learning from the idolaters of the world in Jesus' name. Look at Psalm 115, Psalm 115, reading from verse 4. In Psalm 115, reading from verse 4, it says, Their idols are silver and gold. That's all. They cut them, they mulch them, they melt them, and then put on the image of an animal or the image of a human being or the image of human being combined with a fish, whatever it is, is still silver and gold. It's the work of men's hands. In verse 5, it says, they have mouths, they cannot speak, those idols. They have eyes and they see not those idols. And then in verse 6, it tells us they have ears, those idols, 
but they hear not and no sees they have but they smell not those idols they are just there if rain is falling it will fall on them and if the sun is shining shine on them if the wind is blowing doors is blowing it will blow on them until somebody comes to, to, to carry those idols to another place they are so helpless they are dumb they are deaf they are blind they are powerless they are impotent they can do nothing you know? how will you rely on them it tells us in verse 7 it says uh, in verse 7 they have hands and they handle not feet have day but they walk not neither speak day through their throat and then in verse 8 look at what it says in verse 8 they that make them are like unto them they that serve them are like unto them they that worship them are like unto them they that bow down to them are like unto them they that make anything of them thinking that you know they are something and they're worshiping and they're bowing it says they that make them are like unto them if they are dumb those who make them are dumb if they are dead, those who make them are dead. If they are blind, those who make them are blind. They cannot see the future. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. So is everyone deaf, dumb, blind, unintelligent, not knowing where he's going. All those who trust in idols are like that. You will not worship idol. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it says, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Instead of following after the heathen, after the pagans, after the unbelievers and worshiping idols, it says, O children of God, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Trust thou in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Verse 10, in verse 10, O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. In verse 11, it says, Ye that fear the Lord, ye that honor the Lord, ye that understand the position of the Lord, that he is creator, that he is almighty, that he is the omnipotent one, that he is the one who cannot fail because of that you honor him, you reverence him, you respect him, you exalt him, and you worship him. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. I pray you'll find him to be your help. You'll find him to be your shield in Jesus' name. Jeremiah chapter 3, we're reading from verse 22. Jeremiah chapter 3, we're reading from verse 22. Return, ye backsliding children. Those children of Israel that went to idolatry, the Lord sent his servant to them that they need to repent, they need to return, and they need to come back fully with all their heart unto the Lord. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. We come unto thee. They realized worshiping idol will make them to be lost forever. Worshipping idol will make them to enter perdition, destruction, punishment forever. Worshipping idol will make God to abandon them, abandon them now, abandon them forever. And so they realized, they said, Thou art the Lord our God. We return, we repent, we come unto thee. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 36, Verse 25, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. Then when you return, then when you repent, then when you come with your whole heart, 
and your whole mind and you come unto God, then when you abandon everything you have lifted, everything you have exalted above God, then you say, I respect man, but I don't worship man. When you say, I honor those women, but I don't worship them. When you say, this God will be my God, he'll be above every man in my life, every woman in my life, every material thing in my life, every possession in my life, every position people are running after. When you say, I exalt God above them and I have nothing to do with any form of idolatry, I exalt God above self, above myself. I'll not count the pleasure of the flesh, of my flesh, so important that I relegate my God to the background. When you come fully with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind unto God, and you are not fearful of man, and you are not cringing before man, and you are not worshipping the creature, and you exalt God to his rightful position to worship him, and him only, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. Only then, when I know you have turned unto me with all your heart, will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. And from all your filthiness, and from all your idols, will I cleanse you. And from all your filthiness, all your defilement, all your idols, will I cleanse you. You will do it. And when he cleanses, will be clean in Jesus' name. In spirit, in soul, in mind, everywhere in our thought, in our disposition, everything will be clean in the sight of God. I pray if he has not done it for anyone here, he'll do it for you. Tonight, he will cleanse you. And tonight, he'll bring you to himself. And then you worship God and worship him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and you are totally devoted and dedicated unto him, it will be done in Jesus' name. I'm coming to point number three now. And as we come to point number three, we're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're reading from verse 20. Point number three is the impossibility of fellowship with idols while serving God. Who are the people serving God? Those who are born again and those who are sanctified. Those who don't have any idol in their heart. Those who have been washed and cleansed and purged, redeemed by the blood of his only begotten son. And those who have the spirit of God bearing witness in their heart that they are the children of God. Please understand what we're saying. There are people who say, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God. And they repeat it over and over and over. But the Spirit of God does not bear witness in their heart, the children of God. And the devil is accusing them, child of God, child of God. If you were a child of God, will you be doing that naughty thing? If you are a child of God, will you be stealing? Will you be doing uh, that immoral thing? Uh, if you are a child of God, will you be coming uh, to the agents of Satan and uh, benefiting from the powers and the cults of secret uh, power? And then they just say, eh, I don't want any accusation. I'm a child of God. The Spirit of God must bear witness with your heart that you are a real child of God. And those are the people that are serving God. And while those people are serving God, it will be impossible for them to fellowship with idols or to fellowship with the devil or to fellowship with any sin or anyone that is giving to idolatry 
the word of God is very clear. You are walking in the light, there's no darkness. You are walking in the narrow way, you are not in the broad way. You have a conviction that is, uh, that is stamped on your heart by the Holy Ghost, that you are a real child of God, and then uh, you know that you are on your way to heaven. It will be impossible for such a person to fellowship with idols while serving the living God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that he should have fellowship with devils. You see that? The revelation comes to us, the enlightenment comes to us. Whoever is offering any sacrifice among the Gentiles, those who are not born again, and those who do not know the Lord, all those sins they sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not unto God. And the Lord is seen by the Spirit through Paul the Apostle. I would not that he children of God that she born again people, that those who have been redeemed from their sins, that those who have been cleansed from their sins, I would not that he should have fellowship with devils. Now look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're reading from verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoke they him to anger. He's talking about the children of Israel that they provoke the Almighty God after He saved them, after He redeemed them, after He gave them miracle water to drink out of the rock, after He rained down manna from heaven, after He took them away from the bondage of Egypt. Yet they provoked him with strange gods. With the abominations of their hands, they provoked him to anger. What did they do? Look at verse 17. In verse 17, they sacrificed unto devils. That's what Paul the Apostle is referring to. You are a child of God now. You are redeemed. You are ransomed. You are saved. You are cleansed, you are brought out of the world, out of Egypt, you are on your way to heaven. The people who experienced that before you, they turned back, they backslid, they sacrificed unto devils and not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up whom their fathers feared not. It tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 11. 2 Chronicles chapter 11, reading from verse 15. 2 Chronicles 11, reading from verse 15. And he ordained, he's talking about Jeroboam, he ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils and the cows which he had made and there were children of israel would you be surprised that gave into that he just became a king over them and the lord favored him and then he thought in his mind in his search if these people keep on going to jerusalem then they remember david and the house of david and then they will turn away from me, forgetting it was God that brought that privilege unto him. And then because of that, he made them calves. And then he told them, you don't have to go to the headquarters. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. Behold your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then your ordained praise and those people were so happy they were exalted they were becoming priests and they were becoming worshipers in high places and now he ordained them to serve the devil he appointed them to serve the devil 
and for the calves which he had made. But you know, there were some people that said, we will not go on with this. We will not uh, worship idol. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, and after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their heart to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem. They abandoned Jeroboam. They said, if that is what you want to do and continue, now you want to lead the whole nation to idol worship. And they forsook them. They left Israel and they came to Judah and Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. If you are in any kind of church and they, bring, they talk about Jesus, they talk about Bible, and yet you know that they are worshipping idols and they are not really standing by the word of God. Now you are born again, now you are a child of God. If those people want to continue worshipping idol and doing things that are not according to the word of God, here is an example for you. It says after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, all the tribes of Israel, all this tribe and this tribe and this tribe and that tribe, they saw that Jeroboam was going the wrong way. They set their heart to seek the Lord God of Israel and they came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord God of their fathers. In verse 17, in verse 17, so they strengthened the kingdom of Judah. They abandoned Israel, they abandoned Samaria, they abandoned all those people that wanted to worship idol with Jeroboam and they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, not Jeroboam now, they made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong. Three years, for three years, they walked in the way of David and Solomon. I pray that that same commitment, consecration, and that same focus, the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. Anywhere idolatry is going on, anywhere they're exalting the creature above the creator, anywhere they're exalting darkness above light, anywhere they're toning down, they're watering down, they're diluting, they're compromising the real gospel, and you will leave that place and be in a Bible-believing church that will honor the Lord without adding anything of the devil to it in Jesus' name. Am I talking to children of God? I said you abandoned those things in Jesus' name. And look at you look at First Corinthians. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. In First Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 21, ye cannot drink the cup of the of the Lord and the cup of the devil. Ye cannot. Ye cannot, you cannot come to a place like this and take the pure word of God and take the pure gospel of grace and take the word of holiness and drink in the word, the revelation. And then after that, maybe in the night, maybe the following day, then go to the side of the devil and to the side of idol worshippers and go and drink the cup of devils. You will not, you must not, you cannot, you will not do that in Jesus' name. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. You cannot be, you know, halting between Satan and the Savior, between the devil and Christ our deliverer, between the devil and the demons and the almighty God. You must make your way clear and you must say where you actually belong to. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and devils. You cannot drink of the Lord and drink of devils at the same time. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It tells us, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and demons. 
you cannot serve God and devils. You cannot serve God and idols. You cannot tear your heart into two and give a part to the world and give a part to God. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You will serve only the Lord. I will serve only the Lord. You will serve the Lord in Jesus' name. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Devils have doctrines. Devils have teaching. Devils have instruction. Devils have their practices and their principles. And if you are a child of God, you cannot serve the devil, listen to the devil, learn of the devil, go along with doctrines of devils, and yet say you're serving God. Look at that verse again. It says, in the latter times, those are the times we're living now, some shall depart from the faith. You cannot serve the devil until you depart from the faith, until you drop your conviction on salvation, until you drop the doctrine of holiness, until you drop your passion and pursuit for heaven, you cannot serve the devil. It says they depart from the faith and then they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I pray it will not happen to you. If it will not happen to you, look at verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith. Nourished up in the words of faith. If you are not going to depart from the faith every time, Every day, you'll be nourishing yourself in the words of faith. If you're not going to depart from the faith and go into the doctrines of devils, every time you'll be reading the Bible, you'll be looking at the promises of God, and you'll be nourishing yourself and feeding yourself and uh, reminding yourself of the words of faith and of good doctrine, of good doctrine. Evil doctrine will not come in if you are holding on to good doctrine, if you are embracing good doctrine, if you are reading good doctrine, if you are remembering good doctrine, if you are embracing good doctrine. Doctrines of the devil will not come in just like that. And look at, uh, look at verse 16. In verse 16 of that same chapter, it says, Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. If you are taking heed unto yourself and you are watching yourself when your mind is going uh, to doctrines of the devil, when they're introducing it to you, when they're publicizing to you, and when they're inviting to it, if you take heed of yourself, you're not going to the doctrines of devils. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. If you don't say, well, it doesn't matter anymore. I know I'm saved. I know I'm sanctified. I know I know the Bible. I know I'm going the right way. It doesn't matter what I read. It doesn't matter where I go. It doesn't matter what fellowship I go into. That's how people go into false doctrine. But if you take it unto yourself and to the doctrine and you continue in them, it says continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Remember, I was talking to Timothy. He didn't have any, any doubt in his heart. Timothy was saved. It says, Timothy, my son in the faith. And yet it said, Timothy, you know what? Doctrines of devils will be there in these latter times. And uh, if you take it yourself and you continue in the doctrine, in the good doctrine, then uh, you save yourself and them uh, that hear thee. I pray we'll take heed as the word has given us in Jesus' name. 
uh, we're coming back to first corinthians and we're looking at uh, chapter 10 verse 22 first corinthians chapter 10 we're reading from verse 22 it says do we provoke the lord to jealousy are we stronger than he he was uh, reminding them of the children of israel he said now you children of god and you corinthians are we provoking the lord to jealousy are we stronger than he what did he mean by that let's come back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 reading from verse 15 Deuteronomy chapter 32 reading from verse 15 but Jeshurun wax fat and king thou art waxing fat thou art grown thick thou art covered with fatness then he forsook God. It's referring to the children of Israel. They wax fat. And then it said they grew thick. They were covered with fatness. The Lord took so much care of them. Then he forsook God, which made him and likely esteemed the rock of his salvation. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with uh, strange gods. With the abominations, they provoked him to anger. That's why Paul the Apostle was asking the Corinthians, it happened to our predecessors, it happened to those who are before us, they provoked God to anger, they provoked God to jealousy. Are you going to provoke God like that again? We're going to worship God and God only, we're going to worship. I said you will worship God, only God, you will worship. Matthew chapter 4, we're reading from verse 10. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, then says Jesus unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. Can you imagine this? That Satan, the devil, had the courage, the effrontery to come to Jesus after the Holy Ghost had come upon him like a dove, and after. The Lord God of heaven had spoken, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. After the Lord had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and yet the devil had the courage, the boldness to come and to say, Fall down and worship me, I'll give you something. If the devil can do that to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the eternal Son of God, what do you think about yourself? But thank God Jesus overcame, you will overcome. So Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. Him only, him only shall thou serve. That is how we comport ourselves, that we do not provoke the God of heaven. When we give him the place that belongs to him, and him only, him only will worship. And when you abandon every other thing, all the material things, all the property and everything, and you say, I exalt God, the God of heaven, above everything, everyone on earth, and him only will I serve, the Lord will be pleased at you. And the Lord will bless you abundantly in Jesus' name. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, reading from verse 3, 1 Samuel chapter 7, Verse 3, and Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only and serve him only 
exalt him above everything above yourself above your pleasure above your delight above your desires exalt him above every man on earth every woman on earth exalt him above money above material things exalt him above all the creatures on earth and serve him only then he will deliver you out of the hands of the philistines i didn't hear your amen look at verse 4 in verse 4 then the children of israel put away barely and ashtoreth and they served the lord tell me what follows they served the lord tell me out aloud they served the lord tell me what you will do they served the lord only this god will be our god the Lord is my Savior. The Lord is my supplier. The Lord is my substitute. The Lord is my redeemer. He is the only one I will worship. How about you? I said, how about you? You will not join occultism with your worship. You will not join idolatry with your worship. You will not join my mage idols and gods who are worship only this God, the God of heaven, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, Him and Him only will you worship and great will be the blessing of God upon your life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and make a commitment unto the Lord. Him only will I serve. Him only will I worship. Him only will I bow down to. Him only will I give my heart to. He is my God. He is my King. He is my all in all. He is my Savior. He is my King. And He is the coming one. I will not worship any other one. I will not fear any man. I will not bend before any man. I will not set up an idol in competition with my God him and him only will I worship and then your worship will be acceptable unto the Lord raise your voice to the Lord and give him assurance and confirm that he is your God and him only will you worship 